I'll introduce myself. My name is Michael Gibson. I'll bring you greetings from the first state, Delaware. I'm a, pen, I'm a, a member of Impact on Your World Christian Center in Elton, Maryland. We are now known as Faith Life Center. My pastors are Pastor Ray and Susan Smith. Um, it's a great ministry. It's a great work, and I'm proud, you know, to be a member there. When Apostle Pender first told me the theme for these coming dates, this is what God dropped into my heart and dropped into my spirit. So I'm just going to share it the way that um, he shared it. So when the kingdom collides, to me, the first thing that popped in my heart and popped into my spirit is when the kingdom collides, death paused on purpose. When the kingdoms, plural kingdoms, when they collide, is death. Something is going to die when the kingdoms collide. Either you're going to die naturally or you're going to die spiritually. If you listen to any of my other teachings, I like to talk about the counterfeit kingdom and Satan's kingdom truly is the counterfeit kingdom. But his kingdom, he sets it up very close to God's kingdom. So it's very hard to differentiate between the two. So many times people believe the hype that is written that the devil has a pitchfork that the devil has horns. That is contrary to the word of God. The word described Lucifer as beautiful. He described him as someone that could sing and that he could do a whole octave. He had timbrels in his body. He was the anointed cherub that covered. So Satan definitely was a beautiful creature. Lucifer means light bearer. So Lucifer was the light. He was the light. And never think that Lucifer didn't have light in him. Because if he didn't have light in him, people wouldn't have been drawn to him because people typically are drawn to the light. So many times we confuse who Lucifer really is. And if you really want to get technical, when you read the word, when you really dive into the scriptures, when God usually refers to devils and vipers and all that type of things, he's actually not even referring to Lucifer. He's referring to the people. So it's the spirit in the people. Um, and God, God is talking to the people mostly when he says, devil, get thee behind me, Satan. He was talking to Peter. Um, when he talked about the den of vipers, he was talking to uh, that, that those priests. Um, so he's not even talking about Lucifer when he refers to the devil. So many of us, when we talk about the devil, God's usually in the Bible, in the New Testament, he's referring to the people. So it's actually the spirit in the people that he's referring to. So he really doesn't refer, refer to Lucifer as an ugly entity. But to get on to what God had laid in my heart, I'm going to just kind of go with this statement. So when she told me when the kingdoms collide, what God had put into my heart was death. There is death when the kingdoms collide. Something has to give. And I'm going to read this. This is not biblical, but this is just what was put in my heart. So there's a statement that says, when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object, it's one of the most engaging storylines of all time. It's the face-off. It usually revolves around two unstoppable foes who eventually meet in the grand finale. So that is a very pop popular statement. So the unstoppable force paradox, also called the irresistible force paradox. I'm going to give you an example. It's like the shield and the spear. What happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? The immovable object and the unstoppable force are both implicitly assumed to be indestructible. Or else the question will have a trivial resolution. Furthermore, it is assumed that they are two entities. So in this example, the unstoppable force in the uh, immo immovable object is like the kingdom of darkness versus the kingdom of light. So this paradox arises because it rests on two incompatible premises. 
that there can exist simultaneously such thing as an unstoppable force and an immovable object. The paradox itself is flawed because if there exists an unstoppable force, it follows logically that there cannot be any such thing as an immovable object and vice versa. So why am I bringing it up? I'm bringing it up because this is what God told me to tell you. So just bear with me and it will start making more sense. So let me move this up here. Let me get over here. Where's my mouse? Where's it at? Give me one second. Here we go. All right, so I'm gonna just read how this all started and then I'm gonna tie it all together. Just get just give me a second. Let me read this. I got a lot of screens open. But it's it's basically a Chinese proverb, and the example that they give it originates from this story, and in the story is a man was trying to sell a spear and a shield. When asked how good his spear was, he said that his spear could pierce any shield. Then when he was asked how good his shield was, he said that it could defend from all spear attacks. So then one person asked him, what would happen if we were to take his spear to strike his shield? The seller could not answer. This led to the idiom, of self-contradiction. So what does this have to do with the Bible? What this has to do with the Bible is this. This contradiction is a false dilemma. Many of us think that Satan is like an unstoppable force. And many of us think that God is an immovable object. Truth be told, Lucifer, is a created being. Therefore, Lucifer is stoppable because Lucifer was created. I'm just kind of laying this because I just want to be as simple and basic as God gave me, and then I'm going to dive deep in. But you just got to think about this. Because many times we, we think that Lucifer is some awesome being, and he was an awesome being, but he no longer has the power and authority that he once had. So what does that got to do with anything? But when you're battling in your mind, when you're battling saying, I can't get over this addiction, I can't get over this thorn in my flesh or whatever it is, just know that Lucifer was a created being. So if Lucifer was a created being, that means there is a supreme being that knows how to stop Lucifer. That's as simple, as basic as I could give it. Um, another thing that I want to share, and then again, I'm going to start really just going into the word portion, but I, I just want to kind of lay this groundwork. Read one other thing. So there are some laws of Newton. And the second law of Newton says the behavioral objects for which all existing forces are not balanced. So the law states that an object dependent upon two variables, the net force acted upon the object and the mass of the object. So basically, that's a lot of gibberish, and I know a lot of you are not scientific, but in essence, what Newton's second law is essentially saying is that the law of motion, when you have an object and another force is observed upon that object, that object will go into motion, meaning that object will move. The third law is the law of action and reaction, and that, that says when one object applies a force on a second object, the second one simultaneously applies force of equal magnitude in the opposite direction. So a lot of that has to do, I know you've seen the little balls where you have a ball sitting and you swing it and the other ball goes this way and it comes back this way and it comes back this way and it comes back this way. That's the law of motion. Why am I going through all of these crazy different things? It's going to make sense in a minute, but I just want to lay a groundwork. So what we're talking about is the idiom of a probable force meeting an immovable object. That's a false dilemma. It's not true, but that's what jumped into my mind. Because when you think about the kingdom, the, the kingdom is the system or God's way of doing things. Well, Satan has a kingdom. He has a way of doing things. And what he is doing, he is applying what I call Newton's law of basically you have an object that is sitting and he is applying a force. 
and that forces to move you in a direction, okay? So when he applies a force, there's a law that has been established and the law is basically something that will act the same way every single time. So Newton's law of motion is true that when you exert a force on an object, it will cause that object to move. And if there's another object sitting next to it, the force will cause that object to move and move back. So what does this have to do with the kingdoms? Well, what I want to show you tonight is that force is always being applied to you. Force. Many of us don't believe that force is being applied to us, but force is always being applied to you. So that's why you're always battling because a force is always being applied to you. Force is the energy as attributed of physical action and motion. It is the energy that causes motion. The adversary, the word adversary is one opponent in a contest. So when kingdoms collide, there is a force that is happening. And if two forces apply equal amount of pressure on an object, so if this car was pulling this way, and you had another car pulling this way, the thing in the middle would not move if they were applying equal force. It will be held, held at a standstill because force is basically the energy that it takes that you apply upon an object. So many of us think that we're not under pressure, that there are no forces. But the word says in Ephesians that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So what we're battling is actually not a physical force. We are battling a spiritual force. And in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to apply it so that you understand it. So again, it's the adversary. So the adversary is your opponent. Destroy. The word destroy means to put an end to the existence of something. The word fulfill, it means to bring about completion or the reality of something. So again, the word destroy means to put an end to something and the word fulfill means to bring about the reality of the thing. The next thing is effect. That's the next word. That is the change, which is the result or consequence. So we have a lot of words, but I just want to be basic before I start rolling. So I'll talk about destroy. I talked about to fulfill. And I talked about the effect. Okay. Now I'm going to get started. So what God really put into my heart. And again, I wasn't trying to be roundabout, but I, I want you to understand and get it the way that I see it. You must understand that force is always being applied. So Newton's law says that if you apply force and the velocity, the speed at which the force is applied, it is going to move you. It's going to cause you to go in a certain direction. That is the purpose of force. The purpose of force is to call the object that is static, that is sitting. Once you hit it, it's going to move. If no force is applied to the object, the object doesn't move. So what I'm going to explain to you that the force that is hitting you, the most powerful force on this universe, the most powerful force on the universe is a thought. The thought is the force that moves you. The thought is the force that takes the static object, you, the flesh, the human man that's come from the dirt. That thought is the force that's being applied to your mind. And that is what is causing you to move. That is what is causing you to move. That is what is causing you to move. So if there is force that is applied that is causing you to move. So what God began to drop down in my heart is what is darkness? Darkness is the absence of light. Darkness actually isn't a thing. Darkness is the absence of light, okay? It's the absence of light. So when you are in the dark, that means you are without illumination. So what I want to explain to you is when the kingdoms collide. So when the kingdoms collided, there came a separation. I'm a Genesis man. I stay in Genesis because I love Genesis. So let me give this to you this way. So what was the birth of the kingdom of darkness? So when God created the earth, the earth was formed. Okay? It's perfect. Earth was perfect. 
the earth was lit, it was bright, it was vibrant. Then a period happened in Genesis 1. And in that period, some time went by. I don't know how long it was because the moon and the stars don't come into the fourth day. And that's when we get into our realm of time. So I can't say if that was one day um, as in our 24-hour time period because the moon and the stars was not created then. So everything that guys make is perfect. He doesn't make things that are flawed. So there was light because God is light. So the entrance of God's word is light. So if God is on the scene, it's impossible for there to be light because God is the brighter light. So when the moon is out, it's the lesser light. When the sun comes out, the moon didn't disappear. It's just that the sun is the brighter light so you can't see the moon. Now I told you that the darkness is the absence of light, but Lucifer is the light bringer. Again, this is a contradiction. But the way God revealed it to my spirit is that the moon actually has a little bit of illumination because you can see at night. So you can be guided by the moonlight, but it is the lesser light. It is not the light that we should be guided by. So the birth of the opposing kingdom or the counterfeit kingdom, as I want to call it, it really happened in Genesis, the birth of that counterfeit kingdom. Because what happened, God placed man in the garden, right? Man was in the garden, everything was beautiful, it was lovely. That was in the man realm, but Satan had already fallen, right? He, he had already fallen. But remember I told you the force that is being applied to us every single day as a thought? So there was this entity that came in the garden in the form of a snake, and it gave a thought. And the thought was that there was some information that God was withholding from you. There was something that God was holding without. He was holding out on you. So what that did was make you see God differently. And because man saw God differently, and because man thought that God was holding out on them, he ate of a tree of the good and knowledge. And when he partook and when he ate of that tree, that tree gave birth to a separation. That tree actually gave birth to darkness. That tree actually birthed the kingdom of darkness because the kingdom of darkness is actually blinders being put over your eyes to the spiritual things. So when the kingdom collides, there will be death because you will die spiritually when the kingdoms collide. Because when you were, when we were a part of God's kingdom, we were spiritually connected. Man was appointed to die. So this flesh body of us was going to die. It, it, it was going to die. Men days were numbered. But the spirit was supposed to reside with God the whole time. There was never supposed to be any separation with the spirit of the father in the spirit that he was communicating with man. But the most powerful force, the thing that was designed to move you, the thing that was designed to take you from being close to God and to push you away from God, the most powerful thought, the most powerful force was the thought. That thought began to push you away. And as you begin to be pushed away, God began to turn away. Literally, if you go read the book in Genesis, God really did turn away because he put a flaming sword that man could no longer enter into his original system. He could never enter into the original kingdom. So when Satan beguiled Eve, he didn't come with a pitchfork. No, sir. He came smooth as a snake. Smooth as a snake. His language, his dialect, his speech was impeccable. It was flawless. It was good enough to get her attention. It was good enough to say, man, God's holding out on me. Why didn't God, why, why doesn't God want me to be smart as him? So what I wanted to tell you about the Newton's law is because there are two forces applying on you. 
And those forces are the thoughts that are coming to your mind. Those forces are the thoughts that are coming to your mind. So when the serpent beguiled Eve, Eve, he said, you won't surely die. But see, what Satan does, he always presents a half truth because Eve didn't die naturally. She died spiritually. And with the death of the spiritual death, that became the birth of the kingdom of darkness. So with the curse that was put to her, there became pain and childbearingness for women. There became pain in the birth of the seed that God was going to put through man. There became the lying, the stealing, the killing. That all came when the kingdom of darkness came. But darkness is the ab absence of light. Darkness is the absence of light. So when God put them outside of his communication, get it? He didn't put them outside of his presence because God is omnipresent. But he put them in a position where they could no longer just communicate with him the way they were communicating with him. There was a time that basically you could call on God and there wasn't any obstacles. There wasn't any barriers. And God would just download and download and download and download to you. But now that every person that comes through the womb of a woman is born into the kingdom of darkness, because the word says that you are born in sin and shaping in iniquity. So once you come through the womb, there is a force that is being applied to you. There is a force that is pushing you away from the kingdom, God's kingdom, God's systems, God's laws, God's way of doing things. So once you come through the womb, you are already on the antichrist system. Antichrist meaning not God, not God's way of doing things, not God's way of thinking, not God's way of acting, not God's way of moving, not God's way of behaving. So the kingdom of darkness starts at the womb. So what the counterfeit kingdom does, it creates these idioms. It creates these idioms that get you in the position where you don't recognize that the kingdom of darkness is in operation. So I'm gonna give you an example of the kingdom of darkness. And you're just gonna say, it's just words. What does that got to do with anything? It got to do with everything. Example number one, the kingdom of darkness says seeing is believing. So that gets us in the habit of saying, I will believe it when I see it. And you become like doubting Thomas was. He said, I will believe it when I see it. Show me the nail prints in your hands. I'll believe it when I see it. But the word says, blessed is the man that believes and don't see. So seeing is knowing. Seeing is not believing. So if you're watching me now, you don't have to believe you see me. You know you see me. You don't have to believe that you hear me speaking. You know you hear me speaking. So seeing is not believing. Seeing is knowing. But the kingdom of darkness creates this type of idiom. It creates this type of force. It creates this type of thought that what that little thought does makes you doubt God. Because you're sitting saying, if God really loved me and if God was going to do it, he would show me. If God really loved me, I will start moving when I see a sign. So we never move on the things of God's kingdom. So the kingdoms have always clashing. The kingdoms have always clashing because you're not moving because you keep saying, I will move when I see it. But the word says, blessed is the man that see, that don't see but moves. Because faith is things that you don't see. Faith is just belief, right? So that's one thing that the counterfeit kingdom does. It gives you something very close to the original kingdom. So it, 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 it sounds hardness to say, I believe it when I see it. But God says, you'll never see it if you don't see it inside your heart, right? So that's one thing that the kingdom of darkness puts up. So why did I say when the kingdoms collide, what happens? Why is that death? That is death because there is separation. There's a flaming sword that was set once Adam created the kingdom of darkness with his decision. He made a decision. And once he made that decision, everyone else that was born after him was born into the kingdom of darkness. 
It says sin entered through one man, but through another man's blood, that sin was going to be washed away. So God spent all the time getting another man back into the earth that was perfect. So what I want to tell you is that there is no unmovable object. There is no unstoppable force because Lucifer was a created being. But what Lucifer has done a good job is mimicking God's word. And he keeps putting these little subtle twists on God's word. Did God really say that? And because you think that God really say that, you don't see the kingdom really operating in your life. Because the little thing of I'll believe it when I see it, well, if you believe it when you see it, you'll never, you'll never get out the boat. You'll never walk on water. You will never achieve great things. So when the kingdom collides, there's death. No, wh wh why do I say that? I'm not going to give you a bunch of scriptures. You're going to have to go Google that or know the word for yourself. So when you go into Matthew, when, when Jesus began to walk in the flesh and he began to walk on the earth, there was people that knew all the laws. They knew all the laws because the laws were made because people were so buck wild that they, they didn't have a consciousness, so they needed a law to help guide them. So when these laws were made, that was the old covenant. Now, God didn't come to destroy, do away with the old law. What he came to do was to destroy the effects of the old law. One of the laws that God put in place, he said, the wages, the pay for your sin is death. He said, the pay for your sin is death. He wasn't talking about your physical death because he said, once appointed on a man to die, God already knows that your days are numbered. He already knows that you're gonna take your last breath. He already knows that. He already knows that the pay for sin is death because the death is the death of your communication. The death is the death of the illumination. The death is the death of the information. The death is the death of the revelation of God. You don't have a revelation of who God is. So you are spiritually dead. You're not alive. You're spiritually dead. But what the counterfeit does is tell you that you're more alive than ever. You have more fame than ever. You have all things possible that you think you can have. The counterfeit kingdom says, do as thy will. But God's kingdom says that the wages of sin is death. So what I'm telling you is when the kingdoms collide, death will always happen. You will either die spiritually or make the conscious decision to do what Romans 12 and 1 says, present your body a living sacrifice. So now you have to die to your flesh if you want to walk in God's kingdom now, which is the spiritual kingdom. See, the natural kingdom that was here back then, it was destroyed in 70 AD. You don't want to believe me, but just Google 70 AD. It was destroyed in 70 AD. That kingdom, that system was done away with. Then the birth of a spiritual kingdom came, and he allowed us to, to be part of the spiritual kingdom. But for us to be part of the spiritual kingdom, we had to put ourselves on the altar. So when Abram had Isaac in the old system, in the old covenant, Isaac was the sacrifice. Abram prepared an altar, and Abram brought his son Isaac. And when he brought Isaac up, he laid Isaac on the altar and he strapped them down because back then in the tabernacle, they actually didn't kill the animals first. They were living sacrifices when they were brought into to the tabernacle to atone for the sin. So you had the brazen altar and it had little things tied and they literally tied the animals up. And the animals knew that they were about to die because God wanted a living sacrifice. He wanted blood. He wanted blood to atone for the death, the spiritual death, the spiritual separation that had happened way back when Adam. The atonement for the spiritual separation was the blood of the people. So, the, so God says that the blood belongs to God. The blood belongs to him. The blood belongs to him. And he says the life of the body is in the blood, but the blood belongs to him. So God required a sacrifice to happen. He required the blood of the animals. So he always required the blood of the animals, but he stopped requiring the blood of the animals when he prepared a body, the body that had been prepared before the foundations of the world, the body that was prepared in the thought of Christ. Because in the beginning, the word and the word was with God and the word was God. 
And then the word became flesh and dwelt among them. The word was in the beginning. Jesus physically wasn't in the beginning because Jesus' body came through the womb of a woman. But the word, the logos, the thought, remember what I told you, the most powerful force is a thought. So everything that is made is made from the things that we don't see. Because the thought of God, once he speaks, it creates the reality that we see. So what you don't understand that the thought of the antichrist system, the kingdom of darkness, creates a reality in your life that you don't yet see. Because the most powerful force that's being applied to you is for you to do the things contrary to the will of God. And when you do the things contrary to the will of God, there creates a separation. And darkness isn't a thing. Darkness is just the absence of light. And the word says that God, he is light and there is no variableness. There is no turning. Variableness means that you actually don't change, that you actually don't turn, that you actually are constant. It is a fixed point. So what does that got to do with anything? The reason why I say that there is no variableness, that there is no turning in God, because the Antichrist, the kingdom of darkness, says that you must compromise. The kingdom of darkness says you must compromise. The kingdom of darkness says that you can't judge me. The kingdom of darkness says that you have free will. But God's kingdom said that there is no compromise. God's kingdom said that there is no shadow of turning. God's kingdom said that his word is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And if God calls this sin, it is still sin. God's kingdom says, I don't care what man's kingdom does to loss. It doesn't negate my kingdom. Your natural laws that you do to create does not negate God's kingdom. So if you want to legalize a drug, it doesn't make it legal in God's kingdom. But what the kingdom of darkness does is say that man's law says it's legal, therefore I should do it. But the word says pay for sin is death. So if you do the things that is man's laws, it will result in death. So when the kingdoms collide, there will be death because now God doesn't require the blood of animals. He requires a living sacrifice. And just like Abraham had to put Isaac on the altar, we have to walk and put our own self on the altar. We must be willing to look and examine ourselves and walk ourselves up on the altar because Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus is not coming down here and strapping me down like Abraham did Isaac, because Abraham was almost like a type of Christ, right? So Jesus is not coming to, to strap me down. Jesus is not actually not coming to restrain me. Jesus said for you to present your body, a living sacrifice. So when the kingdoms collide, there is death to the flesh. If you choose to walk into the kingdom of light, but if you choose to walk in the kingdom of darkness, there is death to the spirit. So when the kingdoms collide, there's always going to be death. Something, something's going to die. And when you walk in the kingdom of light, because we now live in a system where man tries to be God, where man tries to tell you what is right and what is wrong, when man tries to rule from the majority, now you suffer persecution like your father did you will have to bear a cross you will have to suffer persecution if you want to walk in the kingdom of light you will have to suffer people ridiculing you and talking about you when you want to talk about no physical happenings before marriage because marriage is, marriage is honorable in in order for you to enter the course you got to be pierced because there could be no 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 blemish on the priest. Because if the priest went inside the tabernacle, if they entered the course of God, if they wanted to have an intimate encounter with God, they could not have had an encounter with another God. 
if the priests wanted to have an encounter with God, if they wanted to get behind the curtain, if they wanted to get behind the veil, they couldn't come before God dirty. Couldn't do it. If you came before God dirty, you lost your life. That's why they put those little bells on them. Because the bell stopped ringing, we knew that he was, he was not living. But see, the kingdom of darkness says, God's word says, come as you are. See, the kingdom of darkness says, God says, come as you are. When the kingdom of darkness says, do as thy will, that you don't have the right to judgment. What I want you to know is that this whole book is a book of judgment. The whole book is a book of judgment. The whole book, back in Genesis, judgment started. Because if you got kicked out of the garden and there was a flaming sword put in the place so you couldn't get back in the garden, you might not call it judgment. You might not call it judgment. But if I couldn't be in the place that was lush and lavish, that had everything that I wanted, and I had to go in the place that when I actually had to give birth to a thing, I had pain, and that I had to go to a place where something was always chasing me, trying to destroy me. I would call that judgment. If something is trying to destroy you to put it into you, that thing is trying to kill you. But the Antichrist, the counterfeit kingdom, the ungodly kingdom, its ultimate goal is to get you to your second death before you realize your first death. The counterfeit kingdom is always trying to get you to your second death before your first death. I'm going to explain that. Your, your first death is the death that Adam suffered. That was spiritual death. Because Adam's children actually died before Adam died. That was like the natural death, right? So the kingdom of this world wants you to die before you recognize and realize that you need to atone for your sins. Because he, if he can get the breath out of your body, you won't spend eternity with God. And I don't know any other worse judgment that there could ever be is for the Father to turn his back on you for eternity. When God turns his back on you for eternity, there is a void in your, your life that can't be filled. Because darkness is the absence of light. So you will live in a place where there, where there is no true creator God. You will live in a place where there is no light because God is big enough that if he came in, like I gave you the example of the moon, the moon is still out during the day, but because the sun is a greater light, you can never see the moon. God does not go into hell any longer. Because when Jesus went to hell, he took the power of death, took the sting out of death. That death was the sting of the spiritual death, that you can live for eternity with God. So the greatest punishment that man could ever have is spend eternity separated from God. You will spend a lifetime of generation trying to get back to God and never can get back to God. When Jesus cried, Eli, Eli, underlay, Father, why have thou forsaken me? The reason why he cried out to the Father, because that was the first time that he had experienced the separation. The separation was so strong that he cried out that Jesus himself, because that was the Son of Man, that was Jesus, the body, crying out because he wasn't sin, but he took on sin for us. Because Jesus always required a sacrifice. So he took on sin for us. And when he took on sin for us, hallelujah, he cried out saying, Father, why have thou forsaken me? And that wasn't eternity. But if Jesus cried for being separated from God just for a few moments, I don't know what I would do if I was separated from God for a lifetime. So I don't know why you even 
counter contemplate being separated from God. I mean, I know why, because when you're born through the womb of a woman, you are born in sin, shaped in iniquity, you are born into the kingdom of darkness. But because the kingdom of darkness has become so comfortable, you don't realize that you're in darkness. Because the word says you can't serve two masters. You are either serve God, can't serve God and mammon. You will love one or hate the other. So what the kingdom of darkness does is to get you to love it and hate God. The kingdom of God, darkness job is to get you to love it and hate God. So when the word says that we are in this world, but we're not of this world, you're not of this world when you choose to hate the kingdom of darkness and love the light. And when you take on the things of the light, you now have to kill your own self. Let me get a drink of water. So what I'm going to propose to you, just pray for me, is that when you walk in the kingdom of God, it's a suicide mission. You heard me? It's a suicide mission. You better put yourself to death. You're going to have to deny your flesh. You're going to have to deny your earthly desires. You're going to have to de deny your earthly tendencies. You're going to have to deny your senses if you want to walk with God. Because the whole system that you are born into is anti-Christ. That's why God said the Antichrist has been here forever. We keep thinking the Antichrist is just some entity that is coming. And I'm not saying that there's not an Antichrist and a false prophet. I'm not saying that. But the Antichrist system, the ungodly system, was in the earth once the judgment was set. Because the doubt that was created by the force, as I said in the beginning, was doubt. And that initial birth of the kingdom of darkness because of the seed of doubt caused the seed of hatred. Because Cain and Abel, they hated each other. It birthed the seed of murder. So isn't it powerful how the seed of doubt birth the seed of murder, birth the seed of jealousy, birth the seed of covetedness, birth the seed of bitterness. So what I'm trying to tell you, there is a force that is being applied to you every day. And if you give in to that force that is being applied to you every day, what it will do is create a golf fix between you and the creator God that you can't get back to him. And if you keep going on to this world system, it will cause you to kill yourself before you can save yourself. The word says who lose their life is to, to gain it. And to gain your life is to lose it. So if you keep into the world system, you will be gaining the life of the world, but you will be losing your soul. The word says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? So what the enemy will do is present a life to you that is pleasing. He will send a life to you that tells you that you can have all the riches, don't have all the work that goes with it. But that life that is pleasing will cause a separation that will ultimately kill you. Because what you need to understand, Satan didn't get an option for atonement. The atonement came for everybody that was born in a body, in an earth suit. So Satan doesn't get atonement. So misery love company and Lucifer is waiting for your accompaniment. So he has designed this whole system to appease your flesh nature to please the carnality of man. And the carnality of man is that in enmity with God. So to walk in the flesh, you are warring against God. For the word says, be aware of the enemy's devices. Be aware of the enemy's devices. So let me explain it to you. Be at war with the enemy's devices. Be at war because you're in a war, y'all. You're in a war for your soul. You're in a war for your life. 
You're in a war to live for God forever. So you need to be at war with the enemy's devices. But we so plugged into the world, we think it's okay to do as thy will because God, only God can judge me. But you don't understand. See, with God, his word is final. He already cast, he already cast judgment. He said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He said there's only one way to come to the Father, and that's through his son. It's this, it's just that simply said, any other man that tries to any any other kind of way says that he is a thief and a robber. So if you want to tell me that you can do all these things and get into the kingdom, all you're doing is speeding yourself up to your first death. And you'll be just like the man that looked up and said, can you tell my brother to put a drop of water on my tongue? Don't go in that position. I hope that you can understand this round robin of ideas that God gave to me. But I, would, I want you to get out of this message is that when the kingdom collide, death will happen. Something is going to die. But I, what I want you to know is that in the death of that thing, that Satan, Lucifer, is not on God's level. I need you to read your word. God never battled with Lucifer. Read the word for yourself. Michael, the archangel, battled with Lucifer. God never battled with Lucifer. For God to get off of his throne and battle with Lucifer, that means that Lucifer will be equal to him. God is not battling Lucifer because Lucifer is not on his level. What I want you to know, we will never be God. To God in the flesh was Jesus. That was the son of man. The son of God was the Christ. But God gave us all the ability to be the sons of God, sons and daughters of God. So we will never be God, but what God has given us is the authority. So anybody that tells you that you God, you ain't God. You can be like God. You can have the mind of Christ, but you're not God. See, Lucifer fell and Lucifer was kicked out because he tried to tell the whole realm of existence that he was God. See, so if you try to convince yourself that you are God, you are elevating to your status of Lucifer. Because Lucifer said that he could be God. So I know that I'm not God, but I know God has given me the ability to be the sons of God. And I know that the whole world, earth is groaning for the manifestations of the sons and daughters of God. But this is what I want to leave you with. There is hope. I don't, want, I don't ever want to leave you with no hope. So let me just give you this last illustration and I'm gonna wrap it up. We have the authority because we have the fullness of the Godhead bodily with us. If we wanna see the move of God, and if we wanna eradicate the force, those thoughts that the adversary is applying to your mind, you have to take on Christ and becomes Christ's ambassador on the earth. And when you take on Christ's ambassadorship, if you apply to the program, it's a suicide mission because God does require a sacrifice. The sacrifice is to love God with your whole heart, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So you will have to die to yourself you will have to die to your will. You will have to die to gain eternal life.
because God always requires a sacrifice. So if a sacrifice is required, that means there is some judgment coming because things that are sacrificed are killed. So when you walk with God, you don't get to do as thy will. Now nah, you don't get to do as you will. You don't get to dress in the old kind of way you want to dress. You don't get to look in the old kind of way you want to look. You don't get to talk in the old kind of way you want to talk. Now, this is not a lecture on how people dress. But what I'm saying is that when Christ begins to live in you, he will change the way you dress. Because you don't want to look like the world. Because when you really get the mind of Christ, you move far away from the world because you understand that association with the world will break off your communication from the Father. And if you read the book, you see with broken communication from God, what it does. Broken communication from God calls God had to come through like 42 generations. Broken communication with God calls people to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Broken communication with God calls the, the Grecian armies to overtake the children of Israel. Broken communication with God calls the Roman army to overtake the children of Israel. Broken communication with God allowed the Philistines to overtake the children of Israel. So when you become disciplined in the ways of God and when you read what God says, okay, you run from the appearance of evil. Now, I put a, a scripture up earlier that talked about uh, evil communications corrupt good manners. So you can start off good, but if you keep entertaining evil communications, communications are thoughts. That is a force that is being applied to you. So what the world does, and listen, I have cable television. I have Files, if you want to know. Files has a lot of program that is anti-God. Yeah. And if I communicate with certain programs long enough, it will create it, it will create a separation. I'm going to give you an easy, an easy example. Football season is coming up real soon. And football season will become God for many men and some women. And because the football game is on and it's the early game, I ain't going to church. Separation. Anything that creates a separation with God breaks the communication. So you could be walking with God and try to sever the ties and the communication. And I'm not saying watching football is of the devil. That's not the point I'm making. What I'm trying to explain to you is that the world system create things that are appealing. And it's amazing. They put the best shows on the days of the week when most people go to worship. Yeah, facts. They put all the program on in the days that people go to worship. And the one restaurant that is the best selling restaurant that's closed on Sunday, they mad because they closed on Sunday. But Sunday was a day that we were going to have family time. But when you plug into the world system, it, it makes stores open on Sunday. When you plug into the world system, it takes holidays and makes you work on holidays. The store's not even closed anymore. Because the world system wants to keep you so busy that you literally kill yourself instead of saving yourself. But this is what I want to leave you. When you take on the mind of Christ, you're not God but you have God's authority in the earth. So when Adam, Adam took the thought from the false kingdom, he abdicated the throne and gave up his authority. So I'm gonna give you an example of authority. So take a police officer. He stands in the middle of the street and he conducts traffic. Cars are coming that weigh one ton, 1,000 pounds, two tons, three tons, four tons, five tons. But the police officer, he puts his hands up and the car stops. Now, the police officer does not have the power to physically stop the car. If the police officer put his hand up to the car, the car would crush him. If it was driving at full speed, he wouldn't win at all. If the car just slowly began to rev on the gas, 
the police officer will begin to be pushed back. However, the police officer has the authority to use the power. Follow me? So now the police officer, even though he can't physically stop the car from moving, but because he is the representative of the power and he has been given authority, he can sit in the middle of Manhattan and put his hands out and put a whistle in and stop buses and stop cars, stop trucks, stop motorcycles because he has the authority. But I want you to understand that we have the authority. So even though we are not God, God is seated. God has given us the power and authority to operate like God on the earth. So when the adversary comes to you and tries to apply pressure, just like the officer can stop the car from coming, we can stop the sickness from coming, we can stop the depression from coming, we can stop the suicide from coming, we can stop poverty from coming, we can stop death, natural death from coming, we can stop all of these things that the false kingdom represents because God has given us the authority to put our hands up and say, stop. And because when you know your authority, when you know who you are, when you are part of God's kingdom, you are bold and bad enough to get in the middle of the street and put your hands up and tell the world to stop. When you understand the authority that God has given us, God has given us the authority to make the thing stop. You don't argue with the devil, you command the devil. We spend too much time trying to rationalize and trying to compromise what God has told us to do. God didn't talk to no devil. He commanded the devil. The devil knew who God was. When God got off the boat, the, the devil's, the, the spirit said, God, why have you come to torment us before the time? The devil knows who God is because Lucifer spent time with God. The devil knows the word of God. So you're trying to battle scriptures with the devil. The devil knows the scriptures because he was around when the scriptures were actually walking on the earth. But what God has done is given us the authority to command the adversary to loose and let go. So if you're in bondage, I command you to be loose and let go and take off your grave clothes. I command you this moment, this day, I don't have to argue with you. You must go because I command you and I walk in the authority and power of God. It's the boldness of God that I can get out in the middle of the street and tell you that God is the healer, tell you that God is the deliverer. Because God has delivered and saved me and set my captives free. The God I serve, you can have. But it's going to cost you to go on the same suicide mission. It's going to cost you to deny yourself. It's going to cost you to deny your flesh. So serving God ain't easy, but it's worth it. Because it ain't easy denying myself a meal because I like to eat. It ain't easy turning off the TV because I like entertainment like the best of us. But when God said it's time to, to humble myself and deny myself, when God tells me to separate, I got to separate because in order for me to keep my authority, I got to keep listening to the force, to the thought of God. He said, let the mind in Christ be also in you. Too many of us have the mind of the kingdom of darkness. So we move at the whims and the waves of the kingdom of darkness. We compromise like the kingdom of darkness tells us to. God has not called us to compromise. God has called us to preach this word, unashamed, unabashful. Satan has already been dealt with. Lucifer no longer has authority over you once you walk into the kingdom of God. So what you need to understand, just like the police officer can walk on any street of these United States of America and command traffic to stop with his hand, he cannot stop a school bus from traveling. He couldn't even stop a motorcycle. But because he is the representation of the power structure, he can cause traffic to stop. He can stop a five-ton vehicle, and that five-ton that five -ton vehicle will just stay in his place until he tells us to go. 
But I want you to know is that we can stop the enemy when we get out the doubt. Back in Genesis, what Lucifer did when he birthed his kingdom, he planted a seed of doubt. And that seed of doubt birthed murder, bitterness, covetousness, jealousy, and all these other things. So to circle back to my original point, I'm a few minutes over, but I'm wrapping up. To circle back to my original point, we don't have a faith problem. We have a doubt problem. God is giving every man a measure of faith. Actually, it says the measure of faith. So whatever measure you need, God has given to you. And God has put the fullness head bodily on the inside of you. So there is nothing holding us back from achieving what God wants us to achieve, except the doubt, which is the thought, which is a force that's been applying pressure to you. And that force that is being applied to you is to move you away from the kingdom of God. So when the kingdoms collide, there will always be death. Something will die. The question is, will, you, will your eyes open up in time before your, spirit, before your natural death so that you can gain your spiritual life? This, this really is a serious thing. No, no joking, no, no kidding aside, this really is a serious thing. The devil, he's been judged. He, he's going to spend eternity separated. And he wants you to be separated from him for eternity. He doesn't want you to spend time with God. And because he was the anointed, Lucifer was the anointed cherub that covered he knows how beautiful it was to be in the presence of God. He know what it felt like to see the glory of God. And because he can no longer get that glory, he, he doesn't want you to praise him. So what this world kingdom will do is put pressure on you to stop praising God. But this kingdom will do is put pressure on you to stop you from saying, thank you, Jesus. What this kingdom will do is to get you to willfully walk away from the things of God. I just want to encourage you to walk towards and run after God. Run after his kingdom with your whole heart, like your life depended on because your natural life doesn't depend on it, but your spiritual life really does depend on it. And it is God's will that no one will be lost. I know I didn't read any natural scriptures today, but I did post some scriptures in the beginning and I encourage you to read them. But God came to fulfill the law. He came to fulfill the law. And God is a spirit and that spirit should live on the inside of you. When that spirit lives on the inside of you, you have the authority, just like the police officer. So command some things. Use your word. Apostle Pender, Apostle Bobian, thank you for your time. I'm going to pray us out. But again, when the kingdoms collide, there will always be death. Just be on the right side of, of life. And it is God that gives life. And it is the engrafted word that will save your soul. That is your mind, will, and emotions. So yes, we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. The iniquity is the sins of our fathers. So yes, the sins of the fathers can be passed down to other generations. But when you take on God's kingdom, when God took power and authority over those things, and God took power and authority over those things, and God is now seated, and he has now given us the power and authority over those things. So you have the power to break all generational curses. You have that power, you have that authority because of the Christ in you. So there's only one God, but we can function as God with the same power and authority. 
This is the anniversary. The Cash App is pinned. I would encourage you to sow into the kingdom. Sow into the kingdom. It's important to sow into the kingdom because prayer moves heaven, but money moves the earth. It costs money to operate. It costs all of us money to have a, a cell phone and everything else. They don't take Thank You Jesus Hallelujah and Kita Mahandas at the cellular company. And I'm pretty sure the radio company don't take that either. It takes cash money. So please, so into good ground. I, I believe it is good ground. I have followed these two for quite some time and I know they bless me. And I just thank God for the opportunity to be able to share on this anniversary. Hopefully it all makes sense the way that God gave it to me. Um, but just know that when the kingdom collide, there will be death. I'm just gonna pray out. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. God, I thank you that people understand what the kingdom of darkness is. And I thank you that people understand the cost that it takes to come into your kingdom. The cost that it takes is to deny yourself and to deny your flesh. God, I ask that people, you increase their hunger and desire to know you, to get close to you, to close the gap, to close the bridge, that there is nothing that you are hiding from us. Because your word says, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Your word says that if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you shall be fed. So if there is anything that you desire, if there is any question that you have, God's word has an answer. But I want you to know that your adversary will always present an answer that is close to the true answer. So you have to use discernment. But God has given us all the ability to discern because God said, try the spirits and see if they be of God. So God has called us to be fruit inspectors. So everyone that come across this live, I ask that you begin to judge the fruit of the people that you are connected with. Because many will come saying that they are prophets, that they are called of God, but they don't have the represent fruit to prove that they are walking with God. You judge a tree by the fruit that it bears. God has called us to bear fruit. God, I ask if there's anyone that watches this broadcast that don't know who you are, that they commit to you. If you want to know what it is, how to walk, and how to stand in the kingdom, you can send a message to Apostle Borean, Apostle Pender. You can send a message to me. We can show you how to walk in the light. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I serve a perfect God, and the perfect God lives on the side of me, and God has the ability to keep me from falling and present me faultless. Don't believe the lies that you can't be perfected in the ways of God. Because God said that we could be presented faultless without a spot or a wrinkle. So if God is coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle, that means that we have the opportunity to be spotless. Now, some of the blemishes that we have made in our life, they have been put under the blood and the blood covers. The blood covers. So if you have been spotted in your life, get under the blood and when you under the blood the death angel will pass over you and you will have the opportunity to stay in god's kingdom and stay in communication with god forever god i pray that lives will be changed because of your word and god i pray that hearts will be wanting to hear more from you because faith is neutral and whatever you put it on, it leans to. So if you put your belief in Satan's kingdom, you will believe in it. If you put your faith or belief in God's kingdom, you will believe in it. So guard your belief system, guard your ear gate, guard your eye gate, and most importantly, guard the things that you allow to enter into the seat of your heart. Because out of the heart flows the issues of life. God, I ask that if there's anybody that has a heart issue, that you begin to work on the heart issue. But the best way to fix your heart issue is to put Christ on the seat 
of your heart. There is nothing too big for our God. There is no circumstance that God can't handle. So God, I pray if, that people turn their situations over to God and begin to walk in your direction. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, Apostle Bolvian, Apostle Pender, I thank you for your time. Stay blessed, but walk in God's kingdom. Because when the kingdoms collide, death is soon to follow. Either natural death or spiritual death. Stay blessed. 